It's never going to stop. In fact, I would guess that going forward uh, that the changes, societal changes, cultural changes, economic changes, all of which are influenced now by not just our region or our state or our country even, we're living in a completely global world, that the minute you kind of pull back and say we can rest on our laurels is the first day of your decline. And so if, you have, if I have one message about uh, this great community, it's to stay focused, to continue to build on your success. I want to commend you on the efforts that, um, that reflect, I think, uh, the, the efforts that Broward County is famous for, which is the expansion of Port Everglades, the dredging and the, the deepening of the, and the widening of the port. It sounds like something, you know, that should be done pretty easy. You all have been working on it for 17 years. I mean, I was, you were working on this before I was governor. <laughs> I've been gone for governor now for a long enough time. Uh, and in those 17 years, you've shown, even though it's taken a long time, you've shown how to make things happen. You've done it because you have a business community that's worked with local political leaders. You have bipartisan support in Congress. There are not many places where you can find bipartisan support in Congress for anything. You have a creative port director who sped up the process with a plan to front Congress the money for design and engineering studies. The mayor tells me that the agreement hadn't been signed to get it back, but I think it's good to have confidence that uh, by moving forward, um, and you'll eventually get that money. And you've dealt with environmental issues that in many places seem insurmountable. Ask the folks in the port of Newark right now, the largest container port in, on the East Coast, uh, how, how they're doing as it relates to preparing for the Panamax uh, freighters, uh, the container ships. They'll, they'll probably be working on this for 20 years and they won't even get a permit because of the complexity of their community, the lack of unity, uh, and the cost will be so extraordinarily. They're trying to raise the Bayonne Bridge, this iconic bridge, to be able to bring these tankers in, and they're about six years into even beginning the permit process to getting a permit to begin construction. This community is going to be successful because you've united and you've focused on these things to make a difference. This work will save thousands of jobs and will create thousands of jobs, not just for Broward County, but for the region as well as uh, the, the state overall. Now, I'm from Miami, as you may remember, and I know that there's a little competition between um, our, our, our ports and our communities, and I think that's a good thing. But when two ports are, when two ports are capable of handling post-Panamax ships, uh, that will be a win for both ports, and it'll certainly be a win for the citizens that are blessed to live here. Florida is a major commerce hub, not just for goods, but for services in the Western Hemisphere. And this is the means by which we can diversify our economy, we can raise our wages, we can create opportunities for entrepreneurs, and we can bring jobs to those who need them. In fact, if you look at Tony's numbers of the net migration, un poco de ellos vienen del sur, no del norte. <laughs> Not everybody comes from Nassau and Suffolk counties. Many people are coming to this country, although that's a wonderful place to come from. Many people come to this community to pursue their dreams because they've lost their freedom in their ho home country and they're making a difference in our own communities and we should embrace them and encourage them to grow and prosper. <laughs> the simple fact that sometimes is lost is that economic development creates the revenue that allows us to do the things to build better communities. It allows us to increase education funding. It allows us to protect the Everglades, na na this national wonder that is just to the, to the west of us. It allows us to protect the abandoned and abused children in our communities. It allows us to provide services for the growing elderly population of our communities. In fact, the only sustained way to increase government revenues is through economic growth. In fact, if you think about it this way, right now the new normal in the United States is about a 1.5% real growth rate over the next decade of time. I hate that term, new normal. I hope you hate it as well. Every time I hear new normal, it means we're, we're defining things downward rather than up. We're lowering our expectations. We're limiting our, our possibilities. We're becoming less optimistic that we can deliver higher growth. But if we went back to historical growth numbers of 3.5%, and you compound that out over 10 years, in the 10th year, this country would grow an incremental Germany. It would grow, it would grow $4.7 trillion of additional economic activity. And taxed at the current rate, 
of, say, 27, 28 percent at state, local, and federal government levels. That's a trillion dollars of recurring revenue. There is no exotic form of taxation that comes close to that. In fact, when people propose these exotic forms of taxation, taxing assets, taxing income, taxing the air you breathe, the excuse me for living tax that some places have, <laughs> all that does is accelerate the migration to places that recognize that economic growth is the answer, not higher taxes. We benefit from the strange people that come up with these ideas. And the Broward Workshop and many other groups understand this, that and it's why Florida needs to maintain its low, stack, uh, low tax status state. We all know that uh, Tallahassee was hit by the Great Recession. There was d dramatic declines in revenue for sure. But now look at this. The revenue of the state is growing at a faster rate than almost any state in the country because our state has been fiscally well managed and we grew our way out of the hole. Florida has a AAA bond rating, just like Broward County does. I may remind you that S&P doesn't give the federal government, our national government, a AAA bond rating. And that's because of conservative, prudent fiscal practices, managing debt in a proper way, building up reserves to be able to deal with the downturns, and making it a great place to do business. The decisions that Governor Scott has made at the state level and that your leadership has made here in Broward County has put us in this position. And I guarantee you, I don't follow things too carefully on what goes on uh, in the day-to-day -day political realm, but when times are tough and you have to make tough decisions, normally it's not popular, but it's the right thing to do. And it now has allowed us to be poised for economic growth. America should follow the path of Broward County in the state of Florida. We have a $16 trillion debt that grows way beyond our ability to pay for it. We have $70 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities and entitlement liabilities, $70 trillion that we have not dealt with. And Red Ink continues to grow at a rate that is quite troubling. That's why Washington's uh, credit rating has been lowered. The simple fact is we can't tax our way out of this crisis. We can't cut our way out of our crisis. We have to grow our way out of it. And how would we do that? Well, there are a lot of things that we could do. I would suggest that we need to pause and figure out how to uh, provide lower cost access to health care insurance, where we reward prevention, where we um, focus on uh, consumer directed care a lot more. There are better means to, to develop um, the costs that right now and the uncertainty that create that retard uh, job creation. We need an energy strategy based on the incredible innovation of American entrepreneurs, not just natural gas but eventually renewables. We should have confidence in the future that there will be disruptions that will lower costs, and we should make it a strategy. The United States should be energy secure with North American resources and American ingenuity, saving hundreds of billions of dollars that go out to countries that hate us now, in some cases, or are unstable enough to hate us in a heartbeat. We should be investing in our own country, and the, the infrastructure that would be necessary for this energy revolution will create hundreds of thousands of high-wage jobs. We need, to, we need to simplify life. Our tax code is incredibly complex. The compliance costs to just make sure you're not breaking the rules drives way too much costs, and we're not investing in the productive side of life that would rebuild our manufacturing sector if we were focused on this. We need to recognize that economic liberty is a principle that we should embrace rather than through a thousand cuts neuter. Today in the United States, if you look at the Affordable Care Act or the Dodd-Frank rules or all sorts of local and state rules, we make it hard for the next generation of entrepreneurs to be successful. In California, the occupational, the license to set up a company is 860 bucks. That by itself makes it more harder for the next generation to begin the process through trial of error of being successful. The rich are always going to do fine in America, particularly with a monetary policy that basically creates this major asset bubble. What we should be worried about is the fact that in America today, the right to rise has been challenged. And so economic freedom and resisting the temptation to do something every time there's a tragedy, every time someone does a misdeed, every time there's something where there's a cry to do something, we should pause and analyze whether doing something would create greater burdens for law-abiding people that are pursuing their dreams that is greater than the, than the dealing with the isolated case that makes it harder for us to be able to be successful. We've lost our sense and zeal for economic liberty 
across the board, the complexity of society makes it harder for us to rebound and to, to be successful. The simple fact, though, is over the long haul, if we want to create a 3.5% kind of agenda where we grow at that rate and we create prosperity, where our, our spirits are lifted, where those wrong track numbers in the nation begin to be reversed, where people are hopeful and optimistic again, where they're willing to take risks again, where they can dream the biggest possible dreams again and not feel like the system doesn't work for them. To get to that environment over the long haul, we have to build capacity for the next generation to be successful. Today in the United States, not, so, not as much here in Florida, thankfully, because of the great work of teachers and the systems that we've put in place to assure that more children can learn. But we have a challenge here as well. We're, we're not hitting it on all cylinders. Today in the United States, one quarter, one quarter of, of students that take the ACT test pass all four elements of the test, which is the ACT definition of college readiness. One quarter. Today in the United States, 60 percent of students from high school entering our community college system take remedial courses. They redo high school English and high school math because they didn't get it right the first time. Today in the United States, very few of our young people are, 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 are career ready because we've not made the emphasis on connecting their education aspirations with the possibility of getting a job. Today in the United States, one third of of high school graduates that, that uh, take the military entrance exam fail it for the academic reasons, and more fail it because of physical reasons. So basically, more than one half of all young people that try to apply to be get into the military can't do it because we didn't get it right the first time. We can rest on our laurels. We can create a cloud of complacency around it. We can have all sorts of excuses. We can say it's not fair to have high, robust standards for every child. We can say that accountability is really too tough. We can say that the self-esteem of children were, is, is far more important than whether they learn. But let me tell you something. In Asia today, they don't care about children's self-esteem. They care about whether they learn math, whether they can read in English, whether they know, understand why science is important, whether they have the grit and determination to be successful. You tell me which society is going to be the winner in this 21st century, the one that worries about how we feel or the one that worries about making sure the next generation has the capacity to eat everybody's lunch. I would suggest to you, so let me start with a, with a question. A, a child enters kindergarten. His mom maybe be a sing is a single parent and works for a minimum wage job. Perhaps he lives in the inner city or is an immigrant learning English. What do we expect of him? Do we expect him to read by third grade? Do we expect him to learn fractions, to write coherent sentences, to graduate from high school equipped to attend college, begin a career, or join the armed forces? Or as a society, do we look at his circumstances and dumb down his expectations and give his school an excuse not to make every effort, I mean every effort, to assure that he learns? Do we just shuffle him through the system, promote him out of third grade even though he can't read? Let the fourth grade de teacher deal with it, and then the fifth grade teacher deal with it, and then the gaps become so big that no one can deal with it. Perhaps we sanction this, as I said, under the guise of of feelings and self-esteem and compassion because it sounds right, but in fact it relieves all of us, the adults in this room and throughout our communities of their responsibilities, but not their paychecks. So seriously, what would you do? Would you expect more of a child of poverty today? Would you expect the same for that child as you have for your own children? If you do, then you're an education reformer. If you do, and I hope you are, and I hope you have passion about this, I hope we start marching in the streets about this, that an American value should be that every child should have, should start at the same place and should be given the chance to achieve earned success. And there is no possible way to do that without education. Sadly, sadly, though, kids in poverty don't start at the same starting line in many places, although Florida, with a focus on early childhood education, has narrowed that gap significantly. And sadly, Hispanic and African American kids are two and a half years behind their white counterparts at a national level. 
So if you walk into a first grade class in Florida or Texas or California or any place in our country uh, and you look at those faces, you ask how long will it take before they become a statistic that creates demands on government and shatters their potential. To me, it's immoral that we sit back and allow this to happen way too often. And I know for a fact it's not going to create a sustainable community here in Broward County or in my beloved Miami or in the state of Florida if we allow this to happen. We need to be the place in the United States that figures out how to assure that all children are successful early readers and all children are motivated to stick with it through school and that all children, by the time we get to 12th grade and they graduate, are college and or career ready. I wish, because you know, you, you watch TV now, it seems like there's always like a pill you can take or a, there's a solution to everything that's really simple, you know. If you're overweight, just take a pill, it'll all work out. Or if, whatever the life's problems are, it seems like we've simplified things down, even though it's not true, but we, we, you know, we think maybe it'll be true. But in this case, this is, there is no magic bullet. There is no pill that you can, you know, give society for this to, for this to change. It requires comprehensive, a suite of comprehensive reforms. As I mentioned, it starts with early childhood literacy. This state has narrowed the gap early, and that's the smart thing to do. Teachers in Florida actually know how to teach reading, which is a novel idea, because many of our schools of education don't really teach them how to do that. We have the largest pre-K program in the United States, and we have a gate from third grade to fourth grade that was tough to implement, but it was the right thing to do because it's cut in half the number of functionally illiterate students. That's the first step. The second step is high academic standards. And this is quite controversial. It really surprises me. I didn't realize that high lofty expectations and high standards would be so controversial. But trust me, it is very controversial. Common Core State standards are benchmarked to the best in the world. There are fewer of them. They require critical thinking skills. They are, they are, as I said, for language arts and math, significantly higher than the Florida standards and significantly higher than all but a handful of states' standards. And if we are assessing those standards accurately by 12th grade, students that pass that last assessment will be college or career ready. Instead of basically one third of them being college or career ready, this will be a truth serum for our communities to wake up and realize that we've languished way too far. High, lofty expectations, while tough to implement, and it creates a lot of heartburn for a lot of people and a lot of mythologies that have been built around it, and people that don't like assessment will go nuts about it. All the people that are protecting the status quo don't like it, which is a good reason to be supportive of it, because we need to change how we think about these things, and lofty expectations matter. High, high standards with an assessment to measure it in, a, in an honest way is important, but we need to have accountability around that. If you have no accountability, if there's no consequence, then nothing will really change. But if there is a consequence, we've seen what happens in Florida. If every child counts in an accountability system, guess what? The kids that are the toughest to teach are the ones that begin to get attention for the first time. That's why Florida leads the nation on the NAEP test the nation's report card, number one in fourth and eighth grade reading for kids with, that are free and reduced lunch, number, number five, I believe, for African-American kids on the reading test, Thir Hispanic kids, 38, they're better than or equal to 38 states average. Low-income Hispanic kids in Florida do better than the California average. Kids with learning disabilities are number one in the country. It's because our accountability system you know, that the made me such a, such a popular guy amongst uh, a lot of people in this state. I was kind of the eat your broccoli governor, I think, many, many cases. But because we have a consequence that's different for improvement and abject failure and excellence and mediocrity, and that we reward excellence and we hold it up high as an example for the great administrators and teachers of our systems to be able to continuously improve. Because a child that has a tough time reading matters as much as a gifted child. Because of a kid living in poverty mattering as much as a child that may be from family, an intact family of influence, we have seen these gains. Without accountability, none of this would have happened. It is important to realize that and to maintain that. And it is also important to realize that this is not about the system, 
we need to move to a child-centered system, which means parents, particularly parents of low income, should be given the power to choose where their children go to school. School choice is a powerful... I cannot tell you how many people um, believe that somehow that this is destructive of public education when you give parents choices. The simple fact is our schools are doing better and we have the most robust school choice programs in the country. It is not counterintuitive to suggest when you empower parents to make choices that all schools get better. And finally, we're living in 2014 and my suggestion would be we should apply the things that exist today that didn't exist a decade ago, which is embrace the digital revolution. Imagine a school in Pembroke Pines. <laughs> Imagine a school in Pembroke Pines where you have 22 kids in middle school and you have five kids that are extraordinary learners, you have five that are struggling and maybe the rest are in the middle. And you have a teacher that is struggling to figure out, who do, where do I teach? Do I teach the median? Do I teach to the kids that are doing really well? Or do I spend my time focused on the strugglers, the kids that are having the tough time? That is a huge challenge. Our children aren't homogeneous. They come from different backgrounds. They have different needs. They, they learn in different ways. And yet we force teachers, we put them in this incredibly difficult circumstance to teach to the median or teach to the bottom or teach to the top. And the net result is that not all kids get the kind of education that they need. Today we can change that. We can move to a customized learning model where time is the variable and learning is the constant. Not the way we do it today, but the way we could do it. Digital learning can customize the learning experience where children learn their own path, their own way, at their own speed, and where kids that are doing extraordinarily well aren't held back. If they can master the material, they can move on. And the kids that are struggling aren't just pushed along even though they haven't mastered it. And every child can get the attention that they need. That means we need to change all the rules around how we organize schools. But if we embrace this, if this community embrace this, and if our state embrace it in an I'm not kidding way, I could guarantee you that the learning gaps that are a big trouble for our society will begin to subside and that all children will be closer to this goal of, of college and career readiness. To me, public education is the only government program that I know that cures poverty. And so the same effort that you put in community building, the same effort that you have put into widening your port, all of which is spectacular, all of which is important, should be put into improving the governance model of our schools and getting involved in our schools so that our children can gain the power of knowledge. Hoping for the best and thinking about it isn't enough. Demanding it will change lives. And the American dream will continue to be possible for all of our children. I hope that you're up to the task at the Broward Workshop. I'm pretty confident that you will be. Thank you all very much. Testing, testing. Governor, I, I know your uh, great substantive speech, and I know you're trying to be uh, non-political this morning, but I did, I did notice on a subliminal level you managed to put in the same sentence, New Jersey and Bridge. <laughs> um, so just, just uh, to clear the record so we all know, when, in your two terms as governor, I don't Did, think I said New Jersey. Wait a no, second. No, no, you said New Jersey, the Banyan Bridge. Bridge. Okay. Yeah, there you, you go. Right. So anyway, just to clear the subject, when you were governor, did you ever close any bridges for traffic studies? <laughs> <laughs> I told you he's trying to be non-political this morning. All right. Part of America's, yeah, part of America's exceptionalism is that when others in the world looked at America and they said, I aspire to be part of that, in their societies, they were the risk takers and the entrepreneurs who made the, a leap of faith into America. And
And, and I look at today, immigration in America is a broken policy. I could make the list of, of how we've screwed up something that really made America exceptional. Do you have ideas of what can be done? Sure. I mean, one of the things that does separate us is that people that come here uh, legally and illegally um, are, are the risk takers. If you're living in a rural area of, of Guatemala and you come, you're a bigger risk taker than those that stay. People kind of forget this. This is an arduous risk taking thing. And it seems to me the first principle ought to be that legal immigration based on needs for our country should be easier than illegal immigration. And today it's not. We have a broken legal immigration system, which is why we have three million skilled jobs unfilled, because we haven't made the efforts to bridge that gap uh, inside of our own population. And we have these, these, these jobs um, that are unfilled uh, that we could fill if we created a strategy around it. So the first step is to build a legal system that lessens the demands on illegal immigration, control the border. 40% of our illegal immigrants come by, um, by legal means, and they extend their, they overstay their visas. A great country ought to know who those folks are and politely ask them to leave. And these are not complicated things. If we, made, if we were serious about it, we could have a much better, secure America. And then move, our, move away from, and this is a little controversial, Mike, but move away from family reunification as almost the sole driver now of legal immigration in our country. 85% of people that come here